I want to uh, discuss some terms with you um, and work our way through some of the, the pages of Think. I probably won't be referring to the book or, or pointing out page numbers, but if you've read up to page you know, 55, somewhere around there, um, then a lot of these concepts I'll discuss you should be familiar with. And I want to sort of start with, well, I want to start with where we, we left off concerning rationalism and the very clear and distinct idea. Um, I'm going to give you another example of a notion that when you think of it given the definitions, you give the words of the, of the notion, we can reach conclusions that just seem to really make sense and that seem to be uh, futile to, to challenge. I have a bit of a, uh, a, uh, a cold or an infection going on and a little, that, that, hot, that hot liquid helps me so I'm going to be drinking a little bit while we go. Alright, <clears throat> think of the notion of, uh, of a state of affairs of say a house of cards and we'll call that a state of affairs. Now let's make sure that we, we call it a static state of affairs so that it's there's no movement at all okay and let's put it in a vacuum uh, take out all the molecules that might be floating in the air and you have this house of cards now again we're working through a thought experiment which is really how you do philosophical analysis in the main um, so let's let's eliminate earth tremors and all that I mean this is just the absolute most still environment you can think of um, and the house of cards are there are four levels let's say four levels okay if it is in one state of affairs in this case structured so that it is standing on four levels what could ever cause it what could ever cause it to fall all right so just for the thought experiment we've eliminated earth tremors we've eliminated uh, air molecules you know so what would ever cause this thing to fall? Because let's just hypothesize and say it does fall. So, so how does it go from a static state, from, from, from how it was in one moment in time to the next excessive moment of time to, to change? Now this is called the problem with the principle of change. Actually, I don't know if this is actually how it's known in current philosophical jargon. It might be like, the problem with change, the principle of change, whatever. But the notion is there that we don't understand how things actually change. Because what what would have to happen to that card, that stack of cards? It, it was able to stand up in one state of affairs. So if all things stay the same in that state of affairs, the idea is rationally we can clearly see it. It would continue staying directed four levels so for that large state of affairs to change a smaller initial change had to happen in other words we would say something caused right the stack of cards to fall over there's a football game going on in the background and I, they, they're having a horrible season and I think someone may have like actually caught a pass or something so everyone's yelling in the stadium I don't know if you can hear it or not but anyway um, <clears throat> we say there's there's a there's a cause and effect, right? Because you don't just go from one state of affairs to a, another one in a direct this way, unless there is a change, and no change can come about without a cause. See, that's 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 basically the no change can come about without the cause. But we've we're eliminating these causes. We've eliminated earth tremors. We've eliminated air molecules, but then someone might say, well, well, maybe it's like a shifting of the atoms of the card. Maybe the atoms themselves kind of shifted a little bit, or the charge shifted a little bit, and, and maybe that caused another charge to shift, and then with the like avalanching effect, maybe once ca one card's uh, electric uh, polarity went from negative to positive or something, and and then that caused, well, that's, that's very good, you know, that could have because uh, certainly those activities happen on the mi on the uh, uh, ultra mic on the quantum level or ultra mic microscopic level atomic level that's that's the word on the atomic level so uh, okay all right all right so so you're saying one atom 
shifted its polarity. That means that one atom was in a state before of having a certain polarity. And then that one atom went from that state to a different state with a different polarity. What caused it to do that? And again, the notion we're running on here is that there is no action without a prior cause. The prior cause might be mental, the prior cause might be chemical, the prior cause might be physical, but there is no new action in a state of affairs. If the state of affairs can exist without that action, then there is no new action to ever be interjected into that state of affairs that happens in an absurd way. There, there, there's going to be, now that, if you say yes to that, oh yes it can, what you're really dealing with then is magic. And uh, but, the, but you know one thing that you should realize if you want to bring in the word magic is that you never have magic without a magician. And that would be the cause of the magic. Okay, so, and magic is a philosophical concept. I know we treat it like here's a set of magic cards you can buy for, you know, 99 cents and we think it's a kid's thing. But uh, the notion of magic is just simply that, what op that which operates outside of, um, that which introduces causes and effects in the physical realm and at the same time is operating outside the physical laws. That's, I think, a, a fairly decent um, notion of the word magic and I think uh, um, one of the, the late uh, apologists for, for Christianity, Lewis probably, would, uh, would, would uh, use the, the term magic quite a bit and I think that's what he was assuming. Uh, the, oh, the deep magic, the deep magic of, of, of uh, Narnia, right, would be uh, when Aslan or Aslan's father, the emperor, could just speak with his mind change the physical array, what we what we took to be the physical array. When he asked the problem of change, you know, and it, it it's very clear to me that you know this is this would lead you to infinite regress in a certain way. Well well not necessarily well yes infinite regress but in, in, that's always begging the question in the sense of okay so an atom changed the state of its affairs, its own state of affairs from negative to positive. I, I don't even know if they can do that. I, f I forget my own atomic physics, but but uh, um, <clears throat> yeah, they have spin. They can they can they can do crazy stuff with their spin. Okay, so it changed the state of affairs. Well, how did how did it do that? Because we're on the principle that there is no uh, new state of affairs. There's no reason for a new state of affairs to come about when the old state of affairs was sufficient, and it's sufficient if it existed. Okay, so there it was, the old state of affairs, let's just bring it right down to the level of this little atom. Why did it move from that state of affairs, a prior state, to the present state of a different polarity? And uh, you say, well, there had to be a cause for this. Okay, um, because the, op the opposite, first of all, we can't fathom it, and second of all, it, dest it absolutely destroys all meaning. Okay, we can't fathom a state of affairs moving from one to another, okay, without first undergoing some causal effect to make it change. Um, and I think this has to, has to do, I, I, I'm going to digress for a minute here, I think this has to do with our notion of being. If there's one thing that we understand fully, it's what it means to be in terms of the physical sense. So you have a, a collection of parts that make a whole. And when it makes that whole, that whole exists. And when it exists in such a state like that, it doesn't need any more parts. And as soon as you add another part, it actually becomes a different entity. So now it's a stick with a crack in it because you, you know, um, and we understand that this being is really different in its essence now than the first. And but we've added. We know that you have to add stuff to it. Uh, that this is. If I were to do this right, I need to think about it a little more and maybe take thirty minutes to explain this. And it's a, it's a very. Uh, I don't. I'm just going to move on. But uh, but the the notion of of change is a troubling one. And rationally, we can see. Rationally, I can see that the answer to the conundrum is that there is no change. But pragmatically and practically, I guess that's a better word. Practically, as I live the life within this physical array, 
or this physical environment, uh, I do not operate on those principles. So this is something that everyone seems to acknowledge, that there are certain points you can reach at rationally that uh, <clears throat> just don't, don't seem uh, to be how you actually structure the actions you carry out while you're in the physical realm. Um, now, there is a type of, there are two types of, there's really one type of uh, um, knowledge for, for that you get in rationalism. It's called a priori knowledge, okay? A priori knowledge is that knowledge you can think about and, 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 uh, and, and work with as you just look at the terms and see where the definition of the terms and the, the ultimate self-evident presuppositions you're, you're working on where it leads you. A posteriori knowledge, okay, a priori, a p r i o r i, versus a posteriori, a space, p o s t e r i o r i. Uh, <clears throat> now, posteriori knowledge is that what you get after you live in a state of affairs and experience. Now it's always going to be probable because you don't know whether the, the whether whatever it is you think is going to happen is going to really happen just because it's happened a hundred times. A posteriori, a, a posteriori knowledge is what you get when you do an experiment for example. Now there, there are other more subtle types but a very clear and basic type of a posteriori knowledge is what you get when you do an experiment and you just or you take a poll. I mean I would suspect that all of you had a certain type of meal for breakfast, uh, but I wouldn't know for sure until I actually had a poll and had you honestly answer it, and then I would have to take the averaging statement out, and 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 I would get something like an average. And but that's I would learn that, okay? Or like a posteriori would be also like the red the red glowing element on the stove, and you look at that thing and say, oh, that's a nice element. You know, here's I have a red car right here, a little red car I'm playing with. I'm thinking like a kid. We got a little red car. I touched the car. Nothing happens. I'm going to go touch that red element. <laughs> ah, you know, thankfully that hasn't happened to my family yet. But, uh, I mean, they're, we've stressed it so much. They're like, the stove is like the boogeyman to them. So they they're, they stay far away from the stove. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> that would be a posteriori. I mean, before you actually have that first experience, there's nothing inherent in the definition or the structure of the state of affairs that you can understand automatically that's self-evident that if you touch that thing, you're going to be in a lot of pain. It's going to burn you. So anyway, um, now, uh, because I have discussed the notion of change, which ultimately comes down to this notion of cause, I want to just quickly clarify what Blackburn is, is saying. And I don't even know if it's going to be a clarification because he does a pretty good job uh, with what he's, how he's explaining things, I think. But uh, he did talk about a tra uh, transit, uh, cause, the cause and effect, and our notion of cause. That well, not necessarily the modern notion, right, or the postmodern notion, but the uh, the um, the traditional philosophical notion of cause is that uh, a cause is always going to transmit something to its effect. Okay, so there is no cause that that causes something. All right but doesn't transmit part of its own essence or element into that something it causes, okay? So, uh, you know, think of, think of a, an artist <coughs> sculpting something, and you say, well, he transmits part of his flesh? No, no, he transmits part of his attitude, part of her insight to what she or he is sculpting. And uh, um, think of, think of a, a speeding bullet right that hits a pumpkin and just blows that pumpkin to bits why did it blow the pumpkin to bits why didn't it just hit the pumpkin and then just drop straight down well because as soon as that moment of contact it's shared with the pumpkin its energy and the pumpkin couldn't handle the energy i mean that's basically what it is the pumpkin explodes not because of the bullet itself not the lead and all that the pumpkin explodes because it can't handle the energy of the bullet and as soon as that energy hits and transfers to the pumpkin, there's a okay. So, um, I don't know. Maybe if you figure out some way to disperse the energy super quickly on a micro level, micro time level, 
uh, nanosecond level, uh, uh, those pumpkins can, you know, be bulletproof. But uh, but anyway, uh, so you have this, and so God, when you know, if if you if you adhere to the notion that God created, and you know, you you cannot ignore God as a principle of study, as a live idea, if you if you portend to be any sort of philosopher. All right, because you just can't. He has yet to be disproved as far as God's ex existence or whatnot. So you have to you have to consider him in fairness to the philosophical the principles of philosophical analysis. You have to to plug him into your equations. You have to plug God into your equations as a as a live factor and see where those things take you. And so you need in the, the theories you develop of the world. There needs to be a theory that has God as a live uh, foundational L agent, an element. Okay, to do that would be to treat an argument as being disproved when never in history has it yet been disproved. So you have to uh, accept the notion that it is possible. God is a live agent factor. All right. Well, anyway, uh, God. You know, the the uh, historical idea was that God created us, formed us, fashioned us, and in doing that, He imparts some of His image upon us. And it was good. It was a good image. Uh, well, that's that's your tra that that we, let's call that notion the tr the notion of the transient. Uh, no, 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 not transient. <laughs> that means like just passing through time. But the transitive, the transitive cause transports something of itself to its to what it's making. Now, you know, Blackburn I think is right in kind of challenging this notion because he would say, well, think of uh, think of an artist. <clears throat> Think of an artist that would say to himself, I can make a sculpture that represents me. Like it would be like my inner qualities and I'm going to put it joyful or, or, or contemplative or whatever, you know. But so, but the, the active intent of the sculpture would be to form the sculpture in such a way that she views it as representing herself. She puts that in there and she can transfer. This is what I do with phone calls. I just ignore it. So... Uh, she, she, you probably should never try to contact me through the phone. She puts, she puts um, her, which is another reason I never give you my phone number. She puts her, um, it rings four times and then it's done, so this should be the last one. She puts her uh, heart, her soul, and now we get the answering machine. <laughs> I don't know how to pause these videos. I probably should figure out how to do it. My wife and my kids went on a hike today and my girl is now playing with our cell phone. She's trying to pretend that she's the librarian from our city telling me I have 67 books due. So you know she's getting an innocent kick out of this. Anyway, anyway, um, so the artist is portraying you know um, and transmitting some of this attitude, these values into the sculpture. But think of an artist that would say, you know what, I'm going to make a sculpture that actually fools people. And I'm going to put in there the absolute opposite of what I am. Can we then say, and then, you know, I'll sign it with my name at the bottom. and uh, You know, portrait of Melinda uh, Scroby or whatever, you know. Well, you know, are we going to say that the artist has actually transmitted values and attitudes and beliefs into the sculpture? Or would we rather say there's a deceptive process going on? But even if there is a deceptive process, does that undermine the notion of the transitive cause? Where something about the artist is being transmitted. Well, still on a physical level, you might have problems doing that because the energy of the hands as it, as it pushes forward impacts the clay or whatever she's using to sculpt and it changes its physical contours. But as far as, see, what's happening there is that that notion, which I don't know if Blackburn really, you know, teases it out, but the notion there is work. My my my. Uh, what I just told you is like, well, there still is a transitive cause, even though, as far as like a psychological or an emotional level, the essential, you know, herness that she's trying to transmit into the, if she if if she decides to deceive people and and transfers the exact opposite there, she is still, <clears throat> she is still. Um, my, my girl is doing this again. This must be like a really fun thing to do. <laughs> Actually, it is kind of fun. But anyway, um, 
uh, she she is <clears throat> she's deceiving you because there's nothing essential about her personality that's in that. So you don't really transfer personality, but you do. I don't. Uh, now she's some other business calling, saying I have a bill due or something. Okay. Oh, it's a contest. It's a contest. I need to enter this contest. All right. Let's 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 focus here. Okay. Um, I'm saying that to myself. All right. Uh, but you know, as her fingers approach the sculpture, um, she imparts this power to the sculpture, right, and changes the actual physical contours of the sculpture. Okay. But the trouble with with uh, that is that it doesn't get rid of the notion of the transitive cause because now I'm working on two levels. I'm saying there's a personal being and a physical being. Okay. And that the physical being does transfer that energy. The personal being, then uh, we would have to say, look, if, if causes do not transfer to the effect, then those causes somehow must be mental or personal. Um, so. Give me just a second. I'm going to have to disconnect the phone. Okay, I'm back. Now, um, <clears throat> let's move on, all right? Blackburn uh, brings up a pretty good notion here of, um, of the next great question that, uh, that is stemming from Descartes, and that is the question which is often known as the question of the black box. Uh, the black box idea is that there is a realm in you. It's, it's, it's the ghost in the machine idea. Uh, can you ever know, can other people and other bodies around you ever know your own ghost in the machine? In other words, there is a, there is a, a locus, a, except in God, okay? Because again, the traditional idea would say God, God, God knows, you know, God knows your, uh, God knows your, your thoughts and that sort of thing. But uh, accepting that, you know, no one else can really claim to know that. Now they might be able to hook up, you know, stuff on your head. And, and sense the energy and, and, and chart it on a graph and all that, but they, they don't, I don't think they can really, I know, I know by principle that they would not ever really be able to share your thoughts, okay? So there is a, there is a place of absolute privacy in your mental realm that if you decide never to share it with anyone, it can be your black box for life, all right? Uh, as, as far as other bodies go. So think of how futile it would be for you to actually try to read the minds of someone else. All right, so, uh, well, I, I don't see anything in the absolute definitions of those terms to say that could never happen, but, but it just hasn't happened yet, has it? So the notion of the black box is just that. Um, how, how can we ever actually know what someone else is thinking? Okay, and, and this, this, this uh, question will show up in various ways. For example, I think I asked a question uh, in class the other day about how do you know dogs don't understand you? And it seemed to be, you know, a silly question indeed, but, uh, but, uh, no, you know, there, I, I, I refused, oh, I just, I just haven't ever received a convincing answer as to why they don't understand us. We all assume dogs don't understand English, but we have no proof of this. You know, seriously, what if they have all conspired to simply ignore us? That is a that is a logical possibility. Now, by logic, I mean it's it's not it doesn't inherently involve a contradiction of terms. I mean, it's pretty dumb. It's pretty uh, it's very very improbable, right? But uh, but you know, if if you are going to go, if you are going to try, if you are going to try to 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 dismiss it completely as not an option, not a possibility. You've got to, on some essential definitional level, tell me why it's impossible that dogs understand English. So this that's the notion of the black box, and and um, what what 
Blackboard is trying to do with Ghost of the Machine is he's trying to make you aware that that epistemologically, okay, you are very limited. <coughs> Excuse me. You think, for example, that when you smash your thumb with a finger, no, when you when you smash your finger with a hammer, and you get you smash your thumb with a hammer and you get all that pain, okay. Do, are you aware of your own pain? Absolutely. But Descartes allowed you as much. I mean, really, the one idea that stands for Descartes, but it's such a seminal idea that this is the reason. Well, but this is this is his major contribution, is that you, you can be aware of your own state, okay? But, uh, so you, you know that that's pain for you. Now, you watch another body out there. It has the contours of your sister, so you think it's your sister, or of your dad, so you think it's your dad. And this other body picks up a hammer, and goes at it. You know, this other body seems to be building a bookshelf or something. And all of a sudden, this other body takes the hammer and hits its thumb with it. <laughs> ah! And you're like, that's an analogy. I have taken a hammer. I have hit my thumb. Okay, so what's, how's the analogy? I have taken an object that has a handle with a head. It resembles very closely that object, which has a handle and a head. In fact, I'm using the same... I called it a hammer. This body over here is calling it a hammer. I took the nail. It had a sharp point at the end. He or she, that body has a nail. So you see the the similarities that are extending across the two situations. That's what makes an analogy. An analogy, the word analogy just literally means another rendering in language. But anyway, another rendering. And so here you have a physical analogy. Because that's, a, that's like another version of what you just did. And you see the similarities. And from those four or five similarities, you extrapolate or you... Uh, prognosticate that the that the, the the rest of the analogy, the rest of the event is going to be similar to your own event. So you remember, yeah, I remember picking up the hammer. I remember hitting. I remember hitting my thumb. That body just hit its thumb. I remember all the pain I felt and the way my face looked and the noise I made from this orifice in the middle of my face. And that body is hopping around like I did and grabbing the hand like I did and scrunching up the face and making kind of the same sorts of noises. And from that we say, my inner state that I experienced when I hit my, ham my, my thumb with my hammer is the same inner state. But what Blackboard is saying, what Descartes is saying, what Wittgenstein is saying, because I think Black uh, Blackboard uh, refers to Wittgenstein, it's spelled with a W but it's pronounced with a V, is saying is that you you can't make that assumption. Not 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 in encourageable terms. Now in encourageable terms means terms which can't which are so fundamentally corrected correct that they can't be corrected in a better state, because they're at the highest state of correction. So that's an encourageable deduction or argument or thought process. Now we often use the word encourageable to refer to a person that cannot be corrected. In other words, we kind of give it the opposite meaning and saying the person is encourageable because he or she is so far gone, you know, they'll never be able to emerge from the state of miscorrection. But uh, the actual meaning of the term means that which cannot be corrected any further, or that which cannot be corrected. So I guess it can apply to both. But when you, when you hear someone talk about an encour encourageable idea, they mean it's so clearly said that you cannot correct it. So the encourageable idea, the idea they're saying is encourageable, is that you cannot, on any fundamental basis of reasoning, that that is a encourageable basis, say that you know that inner state of the person, because it might just be a very sophisticated wax dummy, or robot, okay, or hologram, and the hologram is doing it now. I'll let you look at this if you want to, and your your parents on it. Try to figure out if, if you should see this too. But but there are um, it's it's coming. The technology for holographic imagery in live performance with not re with material that has not been prior recorded. So you have a dead performer in a, in a, in in a, a certain festival. He died twelve years ago. And all of a sudden, two years or a year ago, he's performing at this concert. And he's, he's performing music that has not been pre-recorded. How, or moves it. How is this possible? It was holographic. 
It stunned the crowd. It made the news. People were freaked out because it was so real. And it was actually interacting with the other concert participants. And so then it raised the whole, the whole notion of copyright for the music. And then it spawned a, a, a term uh, called deliber deliberties, like celebrities, but dead celebrities, deliberties, because holographic imaging is not possible. So, uh, or it's getting there. It's getting there. So, you know, what if the, how do you know this is not a hologram that's jumping around and doesn't feel a thing, all right? So, uh, to say, okay, from my one, from my one inner experience, I can tell what others are feeling or thinking when I see what they look like on the outside. If you're saying, I can go from the outside into their black box and see exactly what there's. First of all, you're undercutting the whole notion of actors. I mean, haven't you ever watched a movie and you can see someone like just breaking down at the death of her son or daughter or, or wife on the screen? And the actor, the, the character is being played by an actor, and obviously the character's name is Jack P, and the actor, real life actor's name is Jerry S, or whatever. Is Jerry S really sad at that moment? The Jerry S really thinking he lost? No, he's, he's faking it in a very sophisticated way, simply for the screenshot. <laughs> um, although I guess many of the good actors say they can actually put themselves in the moment and all that, but, th but then they can come out of the moment. And as soon as the thing is finished filming, I guarantee you that they don't run off to their, you know, trailers or whatever to finish two more hours of crying. Uh, so I'm just assuming that. Um, and Wittgenstein's idea is, is known as the beetle in the box. Okay, you have one, one box and you open it up and you find a beetle inside. That's like the box would be your body, the beetle would be your interior states. And then you look around and you see all these other boxes and you're like, oh, they kind of look like my box. They each have, you know, uh, eight corners and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, 12 sides and 12 edges and, and uh, you know, six sides and all that. And, uh, oh, oh, each one of them must have a beetle in there. And you see how ridiculous that notion is? So why do we think that other people have pain when they hit their, their thumb on well, it gets a little more sophisticated, right? Because we're going to ask them, did you feel pain? And then they verbally affirm it. And we just trust the verbal signage to be a correct, to, to be true, to be correctly corresponding to the interstate. But um, now what Blackboard did, I know I'm, a, I'm like three minutes over here, so I'm going to finish. But what Blackboard, his contribution, okay, and I think this is original to him in these pages, is that he introduces the notion of... Um, a substance that doesn't have interior states like ours, but looks very much like us. All right, and uh, and and this would be a way out of the mind body kind of a little bit because you know the substances are you have mind and you have body, but because you have mind and body separate, but in the same locale, it's like you have this ghost in the machine, and the ghost is utterly private. It can be; it's a black box. You can never take the machine to indicate exactly what the ghost is doing. Although the ghost, you might be able to say, moves the machine, but then the question would be, who moves the ghost, right? So, but anyway, uh, the ghost in the machine is a manifestation of the mind-body problem, because the mind is in the body, moving the body, okay? But that introduces two separate substances, mind substance and body substance. Now, I did mention in class that there could be a third, you know, that doesn't mean that there's, maybe there's just a whole third new type of substance. And, and I think... Uh, but we don't just know about it yet. Uh, I think Blackburn is kind of suggesting that with his zombie, and he called it ectoplasm or something. But you have the zombie. Well, so he's trying to answer. Well, what what might be this third type of thing? Well, he's seen. Well, it might be two types. One would be the zombie type, which looks like us and talks like us. You know, he's he's getting past the verbal indication that I said might take you out of the problem by saying, "Hey, I do have pain in me." Okay, then I know you're in pain. But anyway. Um, it might be a zombie that's talking like us and acting like us and speaking like us, but deep inside there is no feeling. Catatonic. Uh, so that's the zombie substance. And then he says, well, there's also the mutant substance, okay, that acts like us, speaks like us, reacts like us, but it, and does sense things, does have interior states, but they're not the interior states of ours. How do we ever know that they actually have the same interior space even though they're giving it the same names as they talk about it? Okay. Now, 
you need to read and think about the zombie principle because I had to turn off the phone. She was just calling all the time. I'm, I'm probably going to tell her not to do that, but it was kind of fun. Uh, anyway, um, you need to look at the zombie principle. I mean, the, the mutant principle, because that is essentially the foundation for the question I asked, is that when you look at the thing you think is red and you say that is red, how do you know someone else can look at it and say, yes, it is red, but deep inside his mind, he's experiencing it in the same way you would experience that thing you would call blue. Okay, so you don't even know people are seeing the same colors as you. And, and I, I, did, I had never run across the notion of the zombie type of mental state experience and the... Uh, the uh, the mutant type. So I would I'm thinking that's unique to Blackboard, um, maybe not. But but I think that would be his attempt to sort of give us a uh, a uh, to either drive home even deeper the idea that the black box dilemma is a live and present problem, or um, or to establish the notion that there is a third type of substance out there. Okay, there was a lot of stuff covered in this video with a lot of other distractions. So I hope that it's been profitable you to you. And thank you uh, for taking the time to watch it to the end. I appreciate that.